Well, what's up, guys and girls? Welcome to another live at Friday at three. And as you can tell, Tracy's been in the house. Did a little bit of work on the uh, the, the KLX, and and you can probably definitely tell that the live picture is looking like it's supposed to. Everything's in frame. The lighting is done correctly, and you can tell I wasn't in charge of it. So, yeah, something about a woman's touch, especially when it comes to video. Tracy is the uh, the queen bee, very good at what she does. And I'm thankful to be able to work with her. Well, how is everybody doing today? Well, it looks like I've already got a few questions over in the chat, but as usual, I'm gonna start off by looking at what was sent in and or what I may have missed the last time we did a live. So let's open that up and take a peek. <clears throat> Kirzik5806 had asked, is there any recommendation to change the oil before or after a winter? By the way, thanks for great videos. Well, you're very welcome. And uh, definitely at the end of the season, when you're getting to uh, put your ride into hibernation, you want to go ahead and do an oil change then. The reason being is that oil, once it's been in the motor for a while, it starts to pick up contaminants. And especially when it just sits still, it starts to build up almost an acidic type um, pH inside of the cases. And that can end up doing damage to one your clutch, different gears and different various different moving parts inside of it. So it's always a good idea. Warm the engine up, put it in fresh oil before you put her away for the year. Now, if you haven't done that yet and you were a bad person and then you let it sit in that old oil, well, then you're going to need to definitely change it when you uh, bring her out of the shed and get her ready for the year, because that's what everybody seems to be uh, leaning toward already. Um, I think we had our last fire in the fireplace uh, last week, and it's kind of depressing because that is my favorite time of year is when it's nice and cool. I'm one of those people that will turn on the air conditioner in the house so I can have a fire. I'm that hardcore. All right. Next one is self-reliance for all. Here is the dilemma. I have a 2002 Kawasaki Bayou 220. Ran fine for two months. Uh, then two months ago, it died on me while driving. Bought a new battery this year. Battery is charged. My neutral, neutral light is off, so I'm not getting any power anywhere. Okay. I replaced the solenoid, the battery rectifier, the starter relay works. Could this be the CDI ECU? Possibly, but before you start um, and, and you go replace that, and on the 220 Bayou, it's pretty well known that those have those break down, but that usually has to do with the ignition circuit and not getting fire because it actually has with well, the CDI's capacitive discharge interface that has a capacitor inside of it, and sometimes that fails. What you didn't tell me anything about was on the negative side. So I would be uh, making very sure that I had a good ground, both going to the frame and, and to the battery itself, as well as the connection at the battery and then the connection of that wire going down to the frame. I can't remember where that point is, but I, I know on the Recon, which is a different manufacturer, 250, we used to run into that where the, uh, the ground bolt was starting to loosen up and then would cause it to run very erratically. And that may be what's happening to your Bayou 220. So don't order an ECU just yet. Make sure you're correct on the negative side. Bypass the, uh, the negative wire if you need to, just to see if that is indeed the case or not. All right, David1084. Hi, John. I have an 03 Yamaha Grizzly 660 and the rear brake keeps locking up. I've replaced the caliper piston and seal kit and it still locks up until you release the bleed screw. I'm thinking of getting a new one. I was wondering if there's anything else I can check before purchasing one, which is pretty expensive. All right. Well, you're telling me that you've redone the caliper itself. All right. Have you looked at the, uh, I assume that that's at the, uh, the rotor itself. Have you um, looked at your, your master cylinder? Because what it sounds like to me is the master cylinder is compressing it or compressing the fluid. It's going down to your caliper, the caliper squeezing down, and then it's not releasing. Well, on your master, there's going to be a spring in there. And it's basically just the opposite of what's going on on the, uh, the caliper it's, uh, itself. 
And if that bore, that spring is wor worn out and you can press it and that spring isn't strong enough to push it back, well, then it's going to hold pressure. So I would take a look at your, your master, whether it be the hand operated uh, for the breaker for your foot and uh, make sure that is not the problem because it kind of sounds to me like it is. <clears throat> All right. What else do we have here? All right. <clears throat> Hollis Smith had asked me, hi, I've got a Rancher 1995 350. Great machine. I still own one, although my soon to be, um, what would he be, Gail? Um, not brother-in-law, but uh, what, what would Stephen be? I'd be his uncle. My, yeah, I'll, I'll be his uncle John. Although my my nephew Stephen Barnhill has taken it over, but it is a great machine. Um, the question is, it will crank with a choke for thirty seconds, then will backfire and cut off. Got any suggestions? Uh, definitely sounds like you need to go through the carburetor and uh, clean it up. More than likely, your your pilot jet is completely clogged up. And the only way it's able to get fuel is by you know, running it on choke. So I would head that direction. Um, other thing, another, another possibility, especially on the uh, an older rancher like that, there's a check valve in your fuel tank. And it lets air in without letting fluid out. But if that check valve is stopped up or that, hose, that vent hose is uh, plugged, then it'll run for... 30 seconds, maybe a minute, it builds up a, a vacuum that the tank won't let any more fuel go through it and then it will shut off. So check that first and then maybe take a look at your pilot jets on, in the carburetor itself. Pretty simple to do. And I'm sure we have a video in the playlist that can walk you through it. I think that was like the second unit we ever worked on. And if it's the orange one, that's my personal one or it was. All right, let's switch over to the chat and see what all we've got. Ah, we got a, we have several today. That's so good. John Rice. Hey, John, how are you doing? I am well. I didn't even tell you what I'm doing this weekend. Uh, Gail's actually sitting in front of me. And as soon as we finish up, we are heading down to the coast. Celebrate her birthday weekend. And no, I'm not going to say how old she is, but she acts like she's a half her age. I way out kick my coverage for that one. That is for certain. All right, back to the questions. John Rice, hi, John, how are you doing? I have an R7 that gently smacked a curb. Okay, the fork, <laughs> gently, the forks were bent, <laughs> took most of the damage, they have been replaced, okay. However, the bottom forged triple is slightly tweaked. Uh, it's forged, forged aluminum. Is there any way to straighten it at, is, and it is a new part, it, the part is so new, it's hard to come by. Um, I'm also an experienced machinist. I just want to know if you've seen it done on any bike or concerns. I'd, I'd be very leery of um, trying to straighten it out, especially on a performance machine like yours, uh, like the R7. I, I had a, uh, I did a, a frame straightening on a, a little Kawasaki, I think it was a 2015 Z125. And, you know, it, it bent the frame and the forks survived, believe it or not. And it something that entry level, I really wasn't too concerned about, you know, stretching the metal back into position. But the real trick is on that, it was just regular, you know, steel. And you're talking about aluminum. And with the steel, it has basically a memory. So it, it kind of wants to go back into position. With um, aluminum or aluminum, there's really no memory. So it, it just conforms into whatever position you push it. And especially with aluminum, once it gets pushed, it doesn't want to go back into its, its natural position. So I would be really leery of doing that, especially on, like I said, a performance machine. Now, you didn't give me the year, but uh, let's take a peek. I'm running over to Partzilla, Yamaha motorcycle and I'm just going to assume a 23 and doesn't really matter different different models front fork now if you're talking about I'm looking at the drawing or the uh, the diagrams number 38 which is the lower lower tree and it has the uh, the neck the, or the part that goes up inside the neck 
we had that in stock. And if our website says in stock, that means it's on the other side of that wall and it's in this building on OEM parts. Now, that, it is a little bit of a fib when you uh, look up a part and it says in stock and it's an aftermarket. That just means the uh, distribution warehouse that we get it from has it. But no, we have that part in the house. So I would definitely go ahead and order it if I were you. All right, Kippy is asking me, hey, I've got an 01 R1, what was a stolen recovery. I replaced the ignition, it cranked, then it was dropped on its side and now it won't crank, crank anymore. Uh, you continue on. I replaced the starter ignition relay switch, checked all the ground, still no crank unless I just go directly power to the, uh, the starter. All right, well, there's the tempo uh, tip over sensor on um, both the R1, the R6, uh, the R1 and the R6 for that year. And I believe it's, if you're sitting on the bike, it's going to be in on the fairing down and on the right side. And there's just going to be, a, I think, a three conductor that goes into it. And more than likely, that's been damaged and because it still thinks the bike's on its side and that's not going to allow it to crank over. So that's definitely where I'd go next as far as trying to uh, diagnose what's going on. Chris R. Hello, sir. Well, how's it going, Chris? Got the pictures and your uh, creative solutions, getting out those uh, the bearings on your swing arm. It's a job, isn't it, dude? But well done uh, getting a workaround. Set a set of sockets and a threaded rod can uh, get you a long way. Michael Taylor is asking me, good afternoon, John. I still haven't replaced my 08 FJR after my 1621 one accident. It's 65. Oh boy. I suffer from old man disease and inflation. Uh, are they terminal? Uh, LOL. No, they're not. And I refuse to give in. Now, now granted, uh, you've got me by a couple, uh, a couple of years, but as I tell, tell, tell Gail, I'm high mileage, but no, just don't give in. <laughs> There's uh was it a country song or just a saying, don't let the old man in. So, Fight him off as long as you can. Chris R is coming at me with a question. When putting on a new chain, do I smack the carrier all the way or where should I leave the marks on an 04 660? Uh, oh, yeah. If you're putting on a new chain, you got a rotator. I, I think it's all the way forward. I know it is on a uh, 400EX. But, yeah, take it all the way and then, uh, then adjust it back. Um, Otherwise, you'll have too many links and you're going to run out of adjustment as the train is the chain starts to stretch, which it will in a hurry, as you know, when you first put them on there. Um, usually when I put on a, uh, a new chain, I'll run it for maybe 30, 45 minutes hard and then go adjust it again because it's going to that initial stretch is going to happen really fast. But then it'll settle down for hopefully a good long time. <laughs> Chris uh, also said uh, at M. T uh, Taylor, I hear getting old sucks. Don't do it. I agree. I agree. Restoration rides. My 99 XR250 has been smoking, and I replaced the piston, the rings, and the valves, valve seals. Okay, what do I do? Well, you've done most of it now, especially on a machine with, um, talking about age, got a little bit of time on it. I think, well, it seems to me what's probably happening is a combination of your valves being worn and then by proxy, the uh, the valve guides as well. Now, I'm pretty sure that uh, Honda still makes the uh, the valve guides. Now, they can be a little bit challenging to press in, especially on those older XR heads. So you may want to turn that over to a machine shop where they can use a, uh, a, a the, the correct jig to get them pushed in and out. Or you may just want to pull out the valves, take a measurement of the uh, the stems themselves, see how worn they are. You might be able to get away with just popping in a new set of valves and calling it a day. That's probably what I would do. But more than likely, that's what's happening because you've replaced every everything else that should be keeping oil out of the combustion chamber except for those two pieces. Chris R is coming back. Uh, I think we need to request an 01 through 05 Yamaha 660R Partzilla build. There isn't much uh, good content out there off to build, and the build manual sucks. Well, I'm not going to argue that with you, Chris. Uh, Yamaha can be a little challenging in their, their manuals. 
it's like two sep two different writers were uh, assigned to each section as they leapfrog through it, or that's the way it appears to me. As far as us doing a, a build on the 660, yeah, maybe, but I've got that 400X that we've got to do first. And I think we're going to try to get it on the bench after this KLX project is uh, wrapped up. Hopefully we can do that within the next week or so. Well, I, I kind of have to do it within the next week or so because there are plans for this little machine that are not under this roof. Can't tell y'all yet. Tim Hurdle is asking me, a DR650 counter part seal. I assume you mean the, the counter shaft of the output shaft seal. Um, it shouldn't be that tough to do. Basically, you've just got the retaining... Um, uh, I can't remember if it's a bolt or an O-ring with it's been shifted or not an O-ring, one of those retaining rings where it bolts to it. You basically just pull your sprocket off and you should be able to go in there with just a pick tool, pop out the old one, then pop in the new one. I'm trying to think if we've done one of those yet or on, on any machine. But at any rate, check our playlist. All the videos start to run together in my head after a while, you know? Nevea Moreno is asking me, or is there better clutch plates other than OEM? I burn through them quick. Hmm, are you sure you got them adjusted right? Well, the OEMs, yes, they're adequate. But if you're really pounding on your, your clutch that hard, EBC makes like four different grades all the way up to their carbon fiber um, series. Uh, that's actually what we put in this little guy this morning. Um, the other one, I see Tim's a com or Trim is uh, commenting on that as well. He likes the Barnett cut clutch plates. Either one of those. They've both been around a long time. Those would be my probably one and two choices. Um, I, I think that would be it. The, the, those two. Either one of those, I think, will get you a, a lot better grip and may, maybe you won't go through them so, uh, so quickly. Uh, Tim, all, or Trim also said, like Barnett with the OEM Springs uh, counter chef. I figured that's what you were talking about. Neva is also asking me, would you say they last longer or withhold more pressure? I'm burning through them due to my, my wheelie practices. All right, well, let's look at that then. The, uh, the ones that we're talking about, they're going to grab better, but they really won't grab more intensely unless you replace the springs with something a little bit stronger. So you do both of those. And usually, well, I know that EBC has kits, and that's also what we did on this one, where they've got clutch plates matched with springs to get that maximum clamping force. And that's what you're going to be after if you're having to really fight to bring up the front end of your machine, which it sounds like what you're, uh, what, what you're doing. Heidi is ask, uh, asking me, I can't even pronounce that last time. Oh, hi, John. This is Paul. I have a question about the valves on a 2016 CRF450R and how they're supposed to feel with the feeler gauge. I can't get my bike to start up. Please help. Are you referring to just um, checking the, uh, the valve clearance on it? Is that what, uh, is that what you're asking me? I mean, you want a little bit, the, the feeler gauge should go in there and have just a little bit of stiction when you pull it out, just like it's getting drawn, like it's got a slightest little bit of clamping force. And if you can put one in there and, and it just has no friction at all, then that's going to be, you know, not quite right. You want it to be a little bit tighter than that. You want it to just glide in there and not fall through. It, you, it's like you could just stick it in there and walk away from it and then it'll pull out with just a little bit of pressure. <laughs> John just uh, responded to that question. You want it to feel tight, but not too tight. Well, exactly. <laughs> uh, Trim had also thrown in OEM or two and two. Oh, for the, uh, the output shaft, the counter shaft sprocket seal, I would definitely go OEM on that one. I'm not sure two and two what that is. <clears throat> John uh, also chimed in. You want to be able to move the feeler gauge without it grinding. That's 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 pretty close to it. John is also asking uh, and make sure you're at top center when you do it. Definitely. 
And <clears throat> Josh also asked me, anyone know how to replace drum brake pads? Well, I do, which make and model. Um, it's not that tough. Usually, uh, I, you've got your your base, your the, or the back the back plane right there. Of course, that's about out of uh, out of view. And it's got that pivot pin at the point at the bottom. Then it's got the other one at the top that you know when it rocks one way or other, it makes the the uh, the brake pads go out, and of course they interact with the drum. I usually just put the springs in, into both and just pull them out and then clamp them in. Not that tough. Well, some of the bigger bikes it, it is a little bit tougher, but something as small as that, you, know, you can pretty much do it with your fingers. All right. Uh, let it jump around on me here. Fully su surrendered. Uh, asked a couple of weeks ago about this the CPS, the CPS, on a 2010 Ray, uh, 800 Razor. You said wiring harness. Does that wiring harness come whole, or is it just that section? Um, I, if memory serves, and when I did a frame on an 800S, I can't remember the year. It was what my personal one. Um, the harness, it was it was one piece, if I remember correctly. If it is the harness, especially on a machine that, that's you know got a few years on it, I, I would be, I would probably go in and just replace the wires that I needed to, instead of having to pull everything, all the plastics and everything apart that you would need to do to get a new harness laid in place. It, it is not a lot of fun to do. Um, I think the most challenging one I ever <laughs> I've ever done was the one on that YXZ uh, 1000 project that we did where I put in a different frame. That thing about wore me out. But uh, also, instead of buying a new harness for that one, where, where we were upgrading from a single radiator up front to a dual fan setup on the newer models in the back, I opened up the whole harness and then made all the changes that we uh, that needed to be made and then wrapped it back together. So in other words, so if you're a little bit comfortable working with wires, just take your time. Don't hack it up and replace whichever one may be broken because we're, we're talking about three wires here that go to a, a sensor. If I remember the correct one that we were talking about and I have a hard time justifying replacing a, an entire harness just over three wires that are probably this long from the ECU going down to the sensor. Just my two cents. Not that I won't, not that I won't sell you, or we won't sell you an entire new harness, but uh, I would try really hard not to uh, go that route because I know they are not cheap. Um, oh, and then you said, could you give me the the correct part number? Yeah, we can. Tell you what, so it's pretty simple to do. Go to Partzilla, Polaris, side by side, 2010. Razor. Now, I don't know if yours, yours is an S or a regular. I'm going to go on the assumption that it is a regular. Then head down to chassis. And electrical. All right. Now, I'm usually faster at it than this. <laughs> wiring harness all options hmm this is interesting there is a kit there's a kit this is part number one kit harness CPS look at there Evidently, there's a repair kit that Polaris makes for this. So you must not be the only person that this has happened to. Part number for that is 2878497. Huh. Interesting. So take a look at that and see if it's going to work for you. All right. Let's get back over to our questions because I want to get out of here and head down to the coast. <laughs> Gail's over there nodding her head. <laughs> All right. 
Ernest Torres. Hi. Oh, how's it going, Ernest? Ernest is asking me, I have an 83 Magna V45 sitting in the garage. Two years, both master cylinders rebuilt. Should I flush both systems to be sure? Thanks. Absolutely. You should actually be flushing out your um, your brake fluid, you know, at least every two years because that stuff, it, even after after so many heat cycles, it starts to break down. And the other disadvantage you have is that with the brake fluid, it, it attracts moisture. So if it, if it can pull moisture past any of those seals, that's what it's going to do. Because I mean, if you've ever worked on a really old um, braking system, you know, that's usually what happens. The inside of those bores rust. Well, how did it get water in there? It pulled it in. There's a word for that. Hydroscopic. I think that's what it is when it pull it attracts water. But I would definitely spend a lot of time flushing that out with some uh, dot four brake fluid. Um, mine is Neva Nevea came back. Mine is a 2014 uh, Honda CBR 500R. It's it's become expensive. Oh come on, it's not that old. She's only ten years old, and I guarantee you we'll have that seal for that one. Viga Brap. Hey, John, my RM250 1999 makes a ticking noise in the clutch basket area in neutral. The noise goes away when the clutch is pulled. Do you think the bearings or a push rod or something else um, may be shot? That really tells me it's probably what I would call a throwout bearing. I mean, I'm not sure. Uh, that may not be what uh, Suzuki calls it, but that bearing that you're push rod is pushing against is sitting there clicking um, and it, it quietens down when you pull in the clutch and actually gets pressure against it. So my, my bet at this point would be uh, that, that bearing at the in, inner part of the hub more than likely. Jeff Boyer has an 08 CRF 450X. It is making some noise when running. Sounds like a, uh, chiming, a timing chain noise. Could it be the adjuster? Well, it's going to be all connected together, no pun intended, because you've got your timing chain, then you've got your guides, and then you've got the tensioner, and all those things are getting, they're under stress all the time at the same time. The guides are getting worn, the chain's getting stretched, and then the, the uh, adjuster is starting to get weaker and weaker. Now, if, if you're getting that kind of noise, it's time to go ahead and address it because if it gets to that point where it can no longer keep any or the correct amount of tension on that chain, what's going to happen? It's going to jump time. And especially on a performance machine like the 450X, you're going to bend valves because that's going to be an interference engine. You just can't adjust the uh, or have the cams go out of timing and, uh, and not end up making a uh, contact in between your valve and your piston. So don't just replace one, two, or three, replace all of them. And that way you know that you've got it under control. Um, Vega came back, by the way, it's an oldie, but it has been restored and it's track ready. Thanks again, not a problem. I love the older machines, but 1999, that's actually new in my book. <laughs> I still have a uh, 79 YZ250 that I've been way too lazy about. Uh, it's 80% complete. I need to go and finish that thing up. Not that I want to ride it anymore. They say with age comes the cage, and I'm living proof of that. <laughs> I don't bounce like I used to, you know. <laughs> Dave Dustin, hey there. <clears throat> Wonderful information, amazing conversation. Well, thank you, sir. I have a 19, here we go. Well, I have a 1970 F5 Bighorn 350, and I need to do the electrical. But do you have any recommendations on how I should clean the oil pump? It's not really that tough. Um, you just pull it down, use a lot of contact cleaner. Make sure if you make, especially on a machine that old, if there's any O-rings or seals in there, don't just spray them down unless you know that you can replace them because once you spray it down with a uh, contact cleaner, it, rubber doesn't like that. <laughs> it usually swells out of shape and uh, 
nine times out of 10 is kind of unusable after that. But kudos for bringing an older machine back to life. Yeah, uh, only recommendation, stay away from the O-rings, contact later. That should be it. Oh, whoop. Orlin uh, Medina has asked me, hello, I have a 2004 450R. Cool. One valve has more, has no more clearance, still running okay. Is it possible to reuse the head and get a head kit that comes with the valve, valve springs, guides, etc.? <sighs> well, sure. I mean, that, that shouldn't be a problem. If you're telling me that the, uh, the seats are worn to the point that um, you can't get any more clearance um, on your valve. I think that's the only choice that you're going to have is to, uh, just to go ahead and replace the head completely. When uh, we rebuilt, uh, is ours an 04 or an 05? Well, when we did our 450R, I ended up replacing the, uh, the head on it as well, if memory serves. So that they're still available, which is a good, which is a good thing. Uh, Chris R came back along with the new chain. What's a good slack measurement without using a slack tool? I'm doing this on the cheap. You already know homemade tools for the win. Chris, I've never really used, I mean, we sell the slack setters, but I've always just, it's always been a rule of thumb for me. I mean, if, if your chain length, if you want to call it is you know, roughly this in the middle, if it's around 30 inches, I want to see about an inch, inch and a quarter to an inch and a half of play up and down in the center. That's usually what I go for. It's the way I've adjusted my chains since day one. <laughs> and that's going back a long time ago. But it's always it has always served me well, that inch and a quarter, inch and a half of play. No more than that. Uh, yeah, definitely no less than that, though. <clears throat> I did screw up one time. It was actually on somebody else's machine. I, I tightened up the chain and really wasn't paying attention. Went out there. He did maybe a half a lap. Snapped the chain. So I ended up having to buy him one. Sorry about that, Blair. <laughs> oh, John Rice. Thanks. You guys have got... Thanks. You guys must have got one before they went on backwater. I'm a tech at a dealership. Ah, okay. Well, shoot, come get it, man. It's because, uh, like I said, if it's if it says we've got it, we've got it. It is uh, not pulling your your chain. All right, now quit. There. Ellis has asked me. I have a 2007 420 Rancher. Will not fire. Whew. Well, you're not giving me a whole lot to go go on here. But there, there could be a lot of different things that are keeping it uh, from starting. Uh, start out with the basics. Are you sure that your, your plug's in good shape? Replace it. They're not that expensive. Then start working backwards. Are you sure it's actually the fire or she's just not starting? Because that could be either your ignition system or your fuel system. Nine times out of ten, it's going to be the fuel system, and what typically happens on the uh, the 420, especially the the uh, the older ones or the the first ones that came out, which yours is, is I think the uh, the 420 came out in 06, 07, I think 06, is the uh, the fuel pumps had a tendency to stop up, and the filter there's actually a filter that goes on the end of the fuel pump, and go take a peek at that if you're not getting the right fuel pressure. But once again, just we're looking for air, fuel, and spark. I mean, that, that's what we're trying to do. If you've got enough compression and, and you've got a spark, well, it's gonna be the fuel. And whichever one of those three is out of whack, that's, the where, that's where you need to go look. I think we did a help my 420 Rancher won't start because we did some work on a green one. So you may wanna check that playlist on the one that I did some work on here. All right, Mark has asked me, I have a 2006 Yamaha Venture RS. What uh, is the correct clearance on the valves? I love your videos, by the way, many thanks. Well, Mark, you are welcome, but I'm not an encyclopedia, but what I will do is I'll have Hank mark your year make and model. And since I've got dealer access, I'll go in there and next week I will start off the, uh, 
the live to, with the answer to your question. Because off the top of my head, I'm not going to be able to remember that one. <laughs> All right, John, John Williams is asking me, don't jump around. Do you have a CVT cover gasket? Well, which year, make, and model? And as I've said, we're, the, our website is incredibly easy to use. Just head over to partzilla.com, pick out your manufacturer, your year, and the, where is it? Ty, or the, your year, and then the type of machine, and then get down to the model number. And, uh, then go to the whichever subsection to find that gasket on it. But chances are, probably. You wouldn't believe how many square feet are on the other side of this, this wall. I'll go ahead and tell you. Over 200,000. So we have lots and lots and lots of parts. <laughs> and we're proud of it. And we should be. Sorry. Not sorry. Um, Heidi is coming back. Hey, John. Paul again. What's... Uh, what size of shim should I start with on a 2016 uh, 450R? It's kind of a loaded question. Um, there just has to be enough clearance. Start with, you know, probably one of the, on the thinner side because it's annoying to put one in there and it have zero clearance. So go one and, you know, the bottom part of the uh, adjustment shim stack, if you will, and see, and see where that takes you. Uh, Heidi, uh, what's, oh yeah, I'm not gonna know that off the top of my head, but just the smallest, the, the one of the smallest ones. So you've got a baseline to where you can work up to, to see what the final uh, thickness should be. John Williams says, do you need a torque wrench? Big believer in torque wrenches. So yes. Oh, do I need a torque wrench to mount uh, a new tire on a motorcycle? you really should get the correct torque on the axle nut. So I would say yes. I mean, most people just go with good and tight, but honestly, that's not me. I don't want to take that kind of chance, <laughs> especially, well, the, the way I used to ride anyway. But um, yeah, as many of you know, I have a, a penchant for playing with uh, track day cars. And we probably torque those wheels three times a day. I don't want to come around uh, T12 or, or T11 at um, Road Atlanta and not be damn sure that everything's tight, you know? All right. Where are we down to? CC. Mark, what are you asking me there? I thought I just answered that one. A 93 VC CC. Okay, gotcha, gotcha, gotcha. Um, Hank, um, he's given the rest of the information on his Yamaha Venture. So if you would uh, jot down that information, and then I'll find out those valve clearances. <clears throat> Boat, Lake Matt, Boat Lake Mead 1, when do I check the valve clearance on a YXZ? How many miles? I think initially they want you to check it at either 500 or 1,000. And after that, uh, I think the manual calls for every, it's either four, four or five, somewhere in that neighborhood. Your ears are probably going to tell you. And I think we've um, released the uh, the video to uh, check the, the valve clearance on the YXZ project that we were working on. So take a peek at the playlist for it, and I can walk you through how to do it. Really not that tough. Uh, although, just make sure you got a couple of zip ties on hand. <laughs> You'll see. <laughs> Dave Dustin, thanks. I've been the same. I've thanks. I have to sew the same for my 1975 Harley Davidson SX175. The big horn has 1600 miles on it. Man, you haven't put many miles on that per year. Um, ben Cooper's asking me, how do you fix the off idle bog on a TRX 450R non CRF carb? My solution for that typically is to increase the uh, the air fuel on it because nine times out of ten it's not getting enough. So uh, adjust that a little bit, and that should uh, that should get it off the off idle bog. If it's got some 
more fuel and to go into that transition when you pop the throttle on it. Dave Dustin came back. Um, my 1987, oh wow, uh, Yamaha 4 Moto 350 clutch works but feels loose. Do you think the spring plates needs new springs? It shifts out of neutral but has trouble coming back down. Any ideas? More than likely. the uh, those, those springs, especially after coming up on 40 years, um, they're, they're probably getting a little tired in there. So I would say that would be a good, uh, good move. John Williams, do you know where I can get a good torque wrench? Um, uh, they're everywhere. And I, I also did a video um, that, that we did recently. Uh, she, you get a click type or a, uh, a digital. Uh, you'll notice on most of my stuff that I use a digital, but they're kind of pricey. And for accuracy's sake, uh, the click type can be just as good. Um, I've over the years, I've never had a problem using the craftsman stuff. It's been accurate enough. I mean, is it going to get you down in the inch pound range or anything like that? No, but you know, for, for most of, uh, 95% of the stuff that you're going to encounter, it'll be just fine. So I would have no problem recommending the good old craftsman. All right. Ellie came back. Definitely not getting fire to coil handlebar switch. Cuts fuel pump off and on. Okay. I watched your video on the 420. No start. Brand new spark plug tested. Uh, other ATP was good. Thinking stator. That's where I was going to head next. And it's not so much your stator as the pickup coil, but it, <laughs> Gail's getting bored. She just yawned. Um, there's a pickup coil associated with the stator. It's in the same harness, and you can't replace one without the other. So that may be what you need to do. <clears throat> All right, guys, I managed to catch you, and I went long today, <laughs> 42 minutes. All right, guys, well, I'm going to call it a day and shut down all these lights and jump in the truck and uh, head south. So, uh, Hank, if you would make notes of uh, those couple of things I need to look up, and I will lead off with that uh, next week. Well, everybody... Bunch of good questions today. That makes the time just fly by for me anyway. And uh, it makes makes this part of my job a whole lot of fun. Well, we want to say thanks for coming here, spending a little bit of time with us. Once again, sending me great questions. Everybody have a great weekend, a great week. And God willing, we will see you again next Friday at 3 p.m. Y'all take care.